Wilson's Wildlife Solutions Across the SCP community, and especially on this channel, there tends to be a lot of focus on the more horrific aspects of the SCP universe. Anomalies that can easily kill and maim, or nightmarish diseases, or apocalyptic threats are generally more popular than other, simpler phenomena. There's nothing wrong with horrific SCPs, of course, but it's easy to forget that in a universe filled with anomalies, most of them are going to be fairly benign. Specifically, in relation to today's video, there's going to be plenty of anomalous animals that aren't capable of tearing apart buildings, but are still weird enough that they need to be contained. That's where Wilson's Wildlife Solutions comes in, a small organization that has an agreement with the SCP Foundation to take care of many of the more agreeable anomalous animals out there. Let's take a look. Wilson's Wildlife Solutions, or the WWS, has been in operation since 1997, founded by Tim Wilson in Boring, Oregon. The organization consists of ecologists, zoologists, veterinarians, animal control specialists, and environmentalists, and to the public, they can be called in to assist with any sort of animal issue in their surrounding county such as deer blocking the road, or raccoons that keep getting into the trash. They also function as a wildlife rehabilitation center for sick or injured animals. Unofficially though, they also deal in the anomalous, thanks to the area they operate in being an anomalous nexus, meaning that it's a bit of a gathering place for the strange and unusual. The WWS operated on their own for a number of years, until an incident in 2008 brought them under the official supervision of the SCP Foundation. The incident concerned a polar bear that showed up in Boring, which is unusual enough in itself, except that this bear drew all of the heat from around it into its body, causing it to glow, and also causing snowfall in the area. The team managed to capture the bear and put it into one of their recently finished enclosures, paid for through their monthly bake sales. Unfortunately, the enclosure grew increasingly colder as the day went on, and eventually, it started snowing. The team, quite out of their element here, decided to turn on the enclosure's heater, which agitated the bear and caused it to glow immensely bright, somehow destroying the enclosure in the process. Afterwards, they placed the bear in a refrigerated storage place in town, until they could afford a more permanent enclosure. The actual incident, however, occurred when a heat wave hit the county a few days later, which caused the polar bear to absorb large amounts of heat and start an anomalous blizzard. The bear broke out of its storage container and wandered through town, destroying two buildings and killing five people. The freak snowstorm was of course picked up by the government, specifically the FBI's Unusual Incidents Unit. The bear was killed by the UIU during the incident, and the whole thing was covered up as a result of climate change. Then in the aftermath, the Foundation came in and spoke with Wilson, asking him to sign an agreement. The Foundation had of course been aware of the WWS for years, as it's hard for the Foundation to miss that amount of anomalies being in one area, but they had let them be because the WWS were actually surprisingly effective at taking care of so many weird animals. Additionally, the people of Boring, being inside of this nexus, considered all of the anomalous animals to be fairly normal so there was less risk of them breaking the veil. The Foundation had even been financially supporting the WWS for years, acting as anonymous donors to their bake sales. The polar bear incident changed things a bit however, as it became clear that while the WWS were shockingly capable most of the time, there were still occasional animals that were just a bit too much for them. This brought about the so-called Boring Agreement between the WWS, 
the Foundation, and the US government, although the WWS came to refer to the Foundation only as the Supervisors. The agreement was pretty simple. The WWS would continue to operate in Boring as they have been, without the Foundation meddling in their normal affairs, and the Foundation would continue to finance the operation, and take custody of any high threat animals. Tim Wilson notably doesn't care for any authority figures, but even he had to admit that he'd be dumb not to sign the agreement. There's actually quite a bit of material based around the WWS on the SCP Wiki, with a couple of dozen SCPs at least mentioning them, and a whole slew of tales, as well as short documents looking at specific anomalous animals in the care of the WWS, called Critter Profiles. While normally in a video covering a group of interest, I would go over several SCPs related to them, for this one I'm actually going to just be looking at some of the critter profiles, because frankly, when else would I cover them? Let's start with a critter profile on a school of Pacific herring, functioning as a singular organism which the WWS has named Caddy. Caddy lives off the coast of Oregon, but they followed her inland along the rivers as well. When Caddy feels threatened, all of the fish in her school form together into the shape of a giant sea monster, with each fish secreting a sticky substance that binds them together. Any stray herring that Caddy comes across will generally join the school as well, developing similar properties. The giant sea monster form is anywhere from 30 to 50 feet long, and is capable of propelling itself with side-to-side -side motions, akin to a giant snake. The WWS has clocked her top speed at about 30 knots, or about 34 miles per hour, and she's capable of attacking by swinging her tail at high speed. She has, however, taken to one of the WWS members, who she has on occasion let ride on her back when grouped up. Caddy has apparently been in the local folklore for quite some time, known as the Cadborosaurus, and while the WWS don't pay much attention to folklore, they decided to look into it after one of their members caught a glimpse of Caddy while out on a fishing trip. They sent out all three of their boats after it, with a big net, but every time they had her cornered, she seemed to disperse and reappear just out of reach. That's when the head of the aquatics team went out on her own with a bucket of bait fish, and managed to calm Caddy down and feed her the bait. Eventually, she went back to shore, and Caddy followed her, so now the WWS routinely heads out to feed her and keep her away from populated areas. They thought about trying to relocate her to one of the nearby rivers, but the entire school is too large, and messing with an animal's natural habitat isn't their style. They did, however, manage to take some of the fish and extract the sticky substance they secrete, which they've taken to using as an adhesive that works even when submerged. They'd like to begin breeding some of the fish specifically to produce more of this adhesive, which they've used for everything from fixing up a barn roof to keeping muskrats out of the reservoir. Let's move on to something more terrestrial, a hybrid between a Malaysian taper and a greater baku, a type of Japanese yokai which is known for its ability to eat dreams. They've named this creature bakugo, and it's capable of a complex chemical and magical process which involves a special organ that allows it to derive energy from halting human REM sleep. It's also capable of deriving nutrition from eating things a Malaysian taper would normally eat. The profile states that Bakugo is a bit standoffish, but he'll eagerly eat an apple out of your hand or a nightmare out of your brain. Bakugo was rescued from an illegal zoo in Eventide, Oregon, another anomalous nexus that is affected by a perpetual nighttime. Since Bakugo was born in captivity, and had never experienced natural light, he was taken into the WWS's care. 
His mother was illegally imported from Japan and was suffering from malnutrition due to only being able to eat dreams, and not many people willing to sleep in an animal enclosure. Some conservationists, who were part of the dream-focused Oniroi Collective, managed to remotely supply nutrition to both her and Bakugo until they could be rescued. The rescue was not a simple process, due to the government of Eventide being hostile to the WWS and the UIU, so it had to be done in secret. They managed, with some help, to rescue all 52 animals in the zoo, however. Bakugo and his mother were kept together for a following four years, until Bakugo became aggressive towards her upon reaching maturity. Bakugo has been kept in a perpetually nocturnal enclosure, with minimal lighting, but tapers generally navigate based on smell and hearing regardless. Owing to his unique diet, a bed has been included in a cordoned off portion of the enclosure, behind industrial strength plexiglass. Twice a week, a member of the WWS terrestrial team sleeps in the bed, so that Bakugo can snack on their dreams, with priority given to staff members who suffer from especially bad nightmares. Eventually, a member of the team proposed having sleepover parties at the WWS, with kids in and around boring learning about the various critters at the shelter and sleeping in tents close to Bakugo's enclosure. The kids would get a good night's sleep, Bakugo would get a nice big meal, and Wilson's raises awareness in the community. The first sleepover they did was a moderate success, with 20 kids, although Bakugo was a little sick the next day, likely from being overfed. Unfortunately, they later discover that members of the team are actually falling asleep spontaneously while cleaning Bakugo's enclosure. Greater Bakus normally can't put people to sleep, but Pygmy Baku can, and they learn that Bakugo has some Pygmy Baku in him, from his father's side. They're debating about doing a little surgery on Bakugo to remove his hypnosis organ, as it could be quite the problem, especially since he's gained 80 pounds from all the excess dreams. They end up going through with the surgery, but unfortunately it really doesn't go as planned, as it turns out that Bakugo can activate his hypnosis organ while under anesthesia. The surgeon doesn't exactly remember the dream he had when Bakugo put him to sleep, but it seems to have been shared by everyone in the building at the time, and was at least partially tangible, with one team member waking up with her face covered in slobber. In the dream, everyone in the operating room became a proper Baku, with tiger legs and a long tail, and they were surrounded by an entire herd of them. Bakugo was there as well, and they think they managed to communicate with him, but they're not sure. Since then, Bakugo has stopped making people go to sleep, which is good, but there's some oddities. The camera they were using to film the surgery stopped working while they were all dreaming, with the footage being largely corrupted. They did manage to rescue a few frames, one of which is included in the document, depicting two taper in a very trippy, colorful environment. As you're beginning to see, weird animals with relatively low stakes is sort of the name of the game when it comes to the WWS. There's no doubt that they do good work, however, with another example being Maya, a Syrian brown bear that they found terrorizing some clowns in a burning carny tent up by the Clackamas County Fair. Of course, those clowns belong to Herman Fuller's Circus of the Disquieting. Maya used to be apparently just a normal bear, who had incidentally gone snooping around some trash cans near the circus. Fuller had taken Maya into his private tent and spent the night tinkering with her, later revealing her as Maya the Magnificent. 
He then somehow forced her to move in a manner resembling a dance and forced her to sing Entry of the Gladiators, the typical circus music. It was immediately clear, however, that Maya was suffering from this, and eventually she managed to find some revenge on some of the clowns that tormented her before being found by the WWS. The profile says that she's normally rather timid and will stay away from people unless they have food or cigarettes, which she seems to be addicted to. When they first found her, she was wearing a raggedy and stained old tutu with a nasty hat with matted fur. She was also found to be missing some teeth and with a bunch of scars and was quite ornery at first. They managed to get the outfit off and gave her a bath, which she seemed to appreciate. She soon took a liking to one of the team members, who gave her salmon chunks and generally smelled of cigarette smoke. She's come a long way since then, although she still gets scared if someone claps or yells too loud near her, and she absolutely hates chairs. They're hoping to get her off of cigarettes entirely by the end of the year, and she's considered to be a shining example of what a little love and care can do for a critter. They have an enclosure specifically for bears with plenty of space, as well as a little cave for when she needs some alone time. They've been applying some custom-made nicotine patches to her to curb her addiction, and they mention that no clowns are allowed near her. At one point, though, her regular caretaker was off work for personal reasons, so another team member took his place, one who also smokes regularly. They figured the scent would make Maya calm, but instead she charged at him immediately and tackled him. The team member managed to scurry out of the enclosure before being mauled, and he suspects that she attacked him because he used to work as a rental clown to help pay for college. A few hours later, Maya was seen stumbling around, hurling salmon and chicken chunks around her enclosure. They discovered that not only did she steal the man's brand new cigarette pack, she also went and ate the entire thing. The resulting nicotine poisoning did quite a number on her, but she survived although it was a bit of a setback in them getting her off her addiction. For extra safety, they now are making sure that no one who ever was, is, or plans on being a clown gets anywhere near Maya. Next, we have an eastern gray kangaroo named Ringo, who was found in the Utica grocery market. It's unclear how Ringo ended up here from Australia, but apparently the Foundation had been chasing him for some time before the WWS found him. Ringo's unique capability manifests whenever he feels threatened, at which point he will jump around, causing localized earthquakes. After tearing up the market, the WWS found him in the produce storage, munching on some veggies, and a team member managed to calm him down with some apple slices dipped in honey. After taking him back to the wildlife center, they found a large number of cuts and bruises across his body. Apparently his former owners didn't treat him too well, and were planning on using him to cause some trouble. His former owners were actually the Chaos Insurgency, a group dedicated to anomalous anarchy. Ringo was diagnosed with a form of PTSD, and will begin shaking the area whenever someone he doesn't know approaches him. The only one he really likes, however, is the team member he originally bonded with, Michael. The Foundation wasn't crazy about letting the WWS take care of Ringo, but temporarily agreed to let them handle it. At first, they put Ringo in the General Terrestrial District, along with the other kangaroo they have, named Buddy. While the two got along well at first, an incident involving the two fighting over some apple slices led to an earthquake, which broke open the district. Ringo was then placed in his own enclosure, which worked as well for some time, until another incident when a team member stepped on Ringo's tail. The resulting earthquakes nearly destroyed the entire enclosure, 
and the foundation stepped in to say that they'd cover the repairs, but they were sending someone over to discuss Ringo's stability. After a month of discussion, the foundation decided that they'll be taking over containment for Ringo, much to the sadness of the entire WWS team. A note in the profile reads that they're going to keep this document here as a reference, and the best thing they can do is remember the impact that Ringo left on their small wildlife center. Next up is a Bernese mountain dog named Sparky, brought in by a man named Daniel. Sparky's unusual trait is physical in nature, as there's a large gaping hole in his chest cavity, and extra bony structures and flesh sticking out of his rear quarters. None of this seems to especially bother Sparky, although occasionally he seems to lose control over his muscles, and he'll flop onto the ground. He also is highly lethargic, sleeping most of the day, and sometimes pieces of his body, such as his tail or a paw, will simply fall off, necessitating them to be stitched back on. He was brought into a WWS center by his owner, Daniel, while Sparky was looking particularly rough. The team members there gave him some basic dog care advice, but clearly there was a bigger issue at hand. They stitched up what they could and bathed him, but it looked grim for a while, with the vets unable to hear his heartbeat. Eventually though, they managed to get Sparky walking again, and they've been making good progress since. Daniel has been showing up every day to check on Sparky, but when asked what caused his condition, Daniel only murmured about how it's all his fault, and how he doesn't know what went wrong. Unlike the Foundation, however, who would interrogate this guy until they got their answers, the WWS didn't press him on the details. Sparky doesn't seem to like any other animal, so he's being kept in a solo enclosure filled with grass and a pillowed section. Once in a while they buy him a new toy to cheer him up, as long as it doesn't resemble another animal, and he's provided large quantities of water to drink as the liquid often falls out of him. They've discovered some other oddities with Sparky over time, such as one time in which a caretaker accidentally threw one of his toys into a tree. While fetching a ladder to retrieve it though, the caretaker returned to find Sparky with the toy in his paws. Also, Sparky is quite the voracious eater, despite his physical issues, sometimes getting carried away and eating grass and dirt surrounding the wildlife center. Since he seems to enjoy it, they don't forbid him that much from doing so. In a series of correspondences, Tim Wilson writes that while watching over Sparky, he started being very aggressive to other critters, especially the cats next door. He started shaking violently when he saw them, and even managed to shake loose an ear, something that hasn't happened before. In another letter, Wilson asks if they've seen one of the cats from the nearby enclosure, named Furball. He's looked everywhere and can't find her. The following day, however, he writes with great sadness that they found Furball dead. Her entire body was twisted beyond recognition, with fur missing all from her face, and her eyes missing. They're going to look over all of the security footage from the last few days to discover who or what did this to their beloved furball. The next day, Wilson writes again to Sparky's primary caretaker, Jeremy, saying that he hasn't been to work in three days now, and they could really use his help here. Sparky seems to be falling apart more often, and they're running low on thread to stitch him back up. He apologizes if he sounds a bit messy, but another cat, Punchy, went missing today, and they're all pretty distraught. Wilson writes to Jeremy again the next day, begging him to come to work as they're in the midst of a serious emergency. They have all of the animals locked up, 
but more and more of them keep disappearing. Daniel also hasn't responded to any messages, and the last time he was seen, he was reading some sort of weird, torn out page, something related to thaumaturgy. The following day, Wilson writes a message to the entire staff, stating that last night, Sparky went on a rampage. They tried to restrain him, but some sort of shadowy tentacles came out of him and tossed them aside. He then broke out of his enclosure and proceeded to the feline enclosure, at which point he ate all of the kittens present. They tried to stop him, but failed, except for Daniel, who suddenly appeared and started screaming at Sparky. This calmed Sparky down for a bit, but then he started shaking violently before exploding. There were pieces of him and black goo everywhere, and in his place was a weird, transparent thing that looked like nothing Wilson had ever seen before. It and Daniel gave each other a long, final look, with Sparky giving out a short whimper before it let out an ear-splitting howl and disappeared through one of the walls. It then seems that the messages that Wilson had been sending to Jeremy were never received by him, but the last time he was logged in being a week ago in Sparky's enclosure. The final message in the profile is from Daniel to Wilson, in which he states that he is so, so sorry, and he should have never tried bringing him back. Throughout all of these little oddities related to the WWS, it's easy to forget that they still exist within the SCP universe. Finally, we have the Critter profile on Wobbles, which begins with a notice that this profile is super secret. Feowyn Wilson, Tim's daughter, writes that in light of recent events, they've decided it may be for the best to keep information about Wobbles under wraps. She says that if you do not have permission, close out of this screen, and if she catches anyone reading it without permission, she'll send them home early without pay. Quite a bit different than the Foundation, indeed. Moving on then, Wobbles is their name for a Wabagong they've come into custody of recently, a type of bottom-dwelling shark only found near Western Australia. Wabagong are capable of blending into the ocean floor and nearby plant life, and sometimes it's hard for WWS members to even find Wobbles in his enclosure. What makes Wobbles strange, though, is that he's literally impossible to touch. Anything that tries coming into contact with him seems to just bounce right off. It's unclear if Wobbles is fully in control of this ability, but either way, he doesn't like to be touched. They found Wobbles after some people at a beach started talking about a strange-looking critter capable of slipping right through nets and almost repelling touch. Trying to actually catch Wobbles drove the WWS nuts, as nets didn't work, lobster cages were too small, and they didn't even bother trying fishing to avoid hurting things. One suggestion was baiting him with a magnetic object and then turning on a high-powered magnet, but they didn't have the budget. As they were running out of ideas, however, Old Albert suggested they trap him in a tank, as it didn't seem like Wobbles can displace water. They submerged the biggest tank they could find and loaded it with bait, eventually capturing the shark inside of it. Wobbles has been standoffish in containment, avoiding anyone's hands completely, although he's been slowly growing more trusting. He has especially grown more trusting of old Albert, whose arthritis won't let him close his hands all the way. Wobbles shares his enclosure with a few other animals, such as a pair of dolphins, some seals, and an octopus. They added in a few hiding places for him, and every once in a while they'll have to change around the locations of the hiding places, as he'll only use them each a few times. 
They were initially wary of putting other creatures in the same enclosure, but even if the seals or octopus wanted to eat Wobbles, they'd have to catch him first. Unfortunately, an incident eventually occurred when they accepted a volunteer form from a man they had never seen around Boring before. The man claimed to be very experienced with sharks, but when he showed up for his first day of work, he ran straight to the marine enclosure while yelling about a shark punching center. Just as he was about to dive into the enclosure towards Wobbles, however, he was tackled and stopped. It seems that despite being an expert in shark punching, he was clearly not as versed in dealing with humans. They handed him over to the Foundation, who seemed just as confused as they were, but were interested in learning more about his fellow shark punching lunatics. It seems that the WWS can no longer trust people like they used to, and they'll have to do a better job of vetting volunteers. In the meantime, this profile will be password protected, and if any shark punching creeps read it, they should know that this is Wilson's Wildlife Solutions, where all critters are welcome, not Wilson's Salakian Wrestling. Obviously, the general point of Wilson's Wildlife Solutions is a bit more of a light-hearted, wholesome side of the SCP universe. It's still weird and odd, but rather than the cold, clinical perspective of the Foundation, these are people that generally just care about animals, regardless of how strange they might be. I only looked at a handful of the large number of critter profiles there are, and there's a whole slew of tales related to the WWS as well. They've also been involved in some bigger pieces, including ones I've already covered, such as a section of SCP-6500, and more notably, the Insect Hell Cannon, in which the WWS accidentally causes a global apocalypse by being a bit too carefree with some multiplying locusts. I cover a lot of dark, horrific stuff on this channel, but it's always nice to take a little break from time to time and look at some weird, but lovable critters.